All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Kittle, and I am the Communications Coordinator for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And it is an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to Pollinators, Plants, and Pests. Uh, this webinar is being presented in partnership with Snipe Clam Botanicals, Paul Smith's College Vic, and ADK Action's Pollinator Project. And just a heads up, uh, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on APIP's YouTube channel, uh, usually within about 24 hours of the event. And once the webinar is posted on YouTube, I will send everyone here a follow-up email uh, that will include some links to some resources and a link to the webinar. All right, so for those of you who aren't aware, the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program's mission is to work in partnership to minimize the impact of invasive species on the Adirondack region's communities, lands, and waters. APIP serves as the Adirondack Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Uh, it's also referred to as a PRISM, P-R-I-S-M, and we are one of eight such partnerships across New York State. Uh, APIP is hosted by the Adirondack chapter of the Nature Conservancy, and we receive financial support from the Environmental Protection Fund as administered by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So I'm going to give a quick overview of today's webinar, and then I'm going to do the agenda really quick, and then we're just going to kick it off with our speakers. So the purpose of this webinar is really to cover three things. Um, the first is to underscore the importance of native plants, both culturally and ecologically. The next is to explain how invasive species can cause ecological harm. And the last is to encourage everyone to avoid planting invasive species on their property and to instead select native species for planting. So our first speaker here is uh, Satea Quinn Bucktooth. Uh, she is a consultant with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and owner of Snipe Clam Botanicals. She's going to go over the importance of native species to native people's culture and medicine, along with some other things. Uh, next up, we have Martha Vandervert. She's the program coordinator with Paul Smith College Vic. Beautiful place. If you haven't been there, you should check it out. Uh, and Martha is going to go over the relationships between native plants and pollinators and how invasive species can harm those relationships. And then last up, we have uh, Lisa Salomon. She's the chairperson for ADK Actions, ADK Pollinator Project. And Lisa is gonna talk about how to avoid buying invasive species from garden centers and how to instead choose native species for landscaping and gardening. After that, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a really quick heads up about a couple of events we have coming up and talk to you briefly about um, some volunteer opportunities that APIP has. And then we're gonna have a discussion and Q&A with our speakers. So first up is Satea Quinn. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, let me get my screen up here. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. So I'm a co-host, there's all kinds of other things popping up. <laughs> So, Sego Zewakwego, Satayoko Yungyats, we're getting a seal, a Kosasa no Tikitalu, Tano Genoa Wakatehialu. So, hello, everybody. My name is Satayokwa. I am from Akwazasne and I'm Snipe Clan. I own Snipe Clan Botanicals. Um, so I basically work with um, plants, health, and environment, and I like to incorporate um, Mohawk culture or Haudenosaunee culture and uh, language into my work as often as I can. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and so happy I was invited to speak. I um, spoke at Cornell University on invasive species with a couple of my um, colleagues at um, the St. Richard's Mohawk Tribes Environment Division back in the fall. So that's, you know, one thing leads to another and now, now we're here. So mm, let's see, there we go. Um, so for my business, I, like to teach workshops. Um, I find that a lot of the, the knowledge that I was able to learn in terms of traditional medicines, healing, uh, language, and history um, here in Akwazasne, it's an, it's an important aspect to be able to teach what I've, you know, learned along the way. And so I've done workshops with our um, senior center. Um, I was at Syracuse University doing a salve making. There's a small language group here. Um, 
And so I did like a tea tasting workshop with them and we tried to do it all in the Mohawk language, which was uh, pretty difficult, but you know, it's, it was a great challenge. So I've done a few workshops for different um, programs and schools and various groups. I make herbal teas, salves. Um, I go out and I'll harvest my own I'll grow my own in the garden. So uh, learning about plant identification and uh, botany and then medicinal uses has really come in handy. And I've just like, um, once I learned about what plants can do for us and how you can make it, it just kind of snowballed. And I've just been, you know, making things for people as they come up and looking into it. And <clears throat> so these are a couple of things that I make. I love the raspberry leaf. It's probably one of my favorite go-to medicines. Um, I also have um, a contract with the St. Richard's Mohawk Tribes Environment Division as their traditional ecological knowledge consultant. Um, we've done different projects, uh, remediation projects. We're located just downriver and downwind from two Superfund sites, uh, an Alcoa or Reynolds Metal, and then also a GM site. So I've uh, been helping them incorporate traditional uh, cultural knowledge into the remediation efforts in terms of which species we would like to see replanted. Because um, a lot of it is typically things that grow quickly, shoreline stabilizers, and uh, we wanted to incorporate more traditional medicines, um, native plant species, and um, foods that can be foraged in the wild as well. So there's a lot of field work involved, which, you know, I'm very happy to be a part of. We, you know, go up and down the river. We did our plant surveys. Um, we did collections for the plant nursery project. Um, in these buckets here, you can see some sweet grass, which is utilized a lot by uh, the basket makers here in Akwazasne. In the center picture there, the rim of the that basket it's a black ash basket and the splint is dyed and then that rim there is the sweet grass and even though the basket skin get you know really old and passed down generationally uh, oftentimes those baskets will still retain that sweet grass smell so it's really um it's really a nice pleasant smelling if you have ever smelled sweet grass it just makes your heart happy and they say you know it, it wards us against um, bad energies so that's the plant nursery there's the tunnel there to the right um, and then these are community members that have been invited to um, I guess be on a on a plant nursery committee and it's just basically what what do the people of Akwazesne want to see replanted because we know we're we're a river community there's a lot of shorelines here we're boaters and you know, the, the constant waves can erode the, the islands and the shorelines. So um, looking at what type of species we can replant to help stabilize um, our homes uh, or the shorelines of our homes. And then also what the, the basket makers and other people in the community would find useful. And so they're all non-garden variety um, type plant species that we're focusing on. So some of them, are you know the cattail and which is right in the middle there um there's elderflower goldenrod um and then there's a nice stand of sweet flag in the water there and then there's a sweet grass braid on on the bottom and so we have a really um the an invasive aggressive phragmites that is taking up the habitat of the cattail in the ononolu or the sorry the the sweet flag and they're, you know, they're a food, medicinal and um, culturally uh, significant species. So these are some of the things that we're trying to focus on. Um, and so it's important that we continue to do these replantings, um, be advocates for our native plant species, to see them supported and replanted throughout Akwazasne um, so that we can pass on the knowledge to the next seven generations. So um, I'm fortunate enough that I 
went through um, what was called the Akwazasana Cultural Restoration Program, where it was a four-year apprenticeship. And we learned, and that's where I got my start with the traditional medicines and healing. And so now that I have a daughter, I'm able to pass it on to her. And she's um, my pandemic baby. <clears throat> she wasn't really socialized in the beginning. <laughs> um, she's borderline feral, and she just loves being outside to wander in the garden. And um, you may have heard me awkwardly mention, you know, she was a little Quasimodo baby, if that's the only part of the conversation, because I didn't realize he was about to let everybody on. <clears throat> um, she would get bit by a mosquito and then just blow up or she'd fall down and get a scrape. And so we'd start just, you know, taking like a simple plantain leaf, which is uh, not an indigenous species, species but it's been naturalized here and it has very uh, a wide range of uses and so she's learned at a very young age what that plant looks like and how we use it and we just chew it up and put it on like a band-aid and uh, my husband cut his hand last summer and she went and found that leaf chewed it up and stuck it on him and he came over and he's like whoa 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 I don't know if she's supposed to have that in her mouth and I'm like no that's exactly what she was supposed to do like I was, it was like a really proud proud moment so she's um she's picking it up so it it gives me hope for for the future uh, because with all this knowledge comes responsibility right we need to ensure that other people are learning or at least being introduced to it and so that they can discover whether or not they they like plants or they like medicines or they like going out on the river and kayaking and so I just try to introduce the people to, you know, what our relatives out in nature, like our plant medicines and our foods, what they can offer us and how we can learn from them. And also how they can help heal us because um, with my people and, uh, you know, forced colonization and um, like kids being sent to residential schools and having the, the language and culture ripped out of them. It's a very real thing. You know, my, my grandparents, my parents went to some Indian day schools and had to suffer different abuses. And so they're finding right down to the science of it, that trauma gets passed on to the next generation. And so a lot of the focus is on the trauma and how we need to heal from it. And so there are these things that we can utilize and in and helping us heal from those and I always try to also remember like not only did we get the trauma but we also got the the survival skills out of it too so it's um a good way for us to reconnect to nature and have nature not only help us with our health but you know our our spirits and how they've been affected and so I want to talk just quickly about some of the plants that I like to use and how we can utilize our different plant medicines. And so this is a raspberry leaf. There's different types of raspberry. It's a part of the rose family. It's, um, there's so many different types. There's the wild raspberry, which is indigenous to North America. There's a red raspberry leaf. We have blackberry, bramble berries, black cat berries. They all look pretty similar. I, it's one of my missions to figure out all the I don't know, I guess like how to identify each and every one because they are so similar. Um, but the raspberry leaf is very nutritious. Uh, you can drink it in a tea form. Um, the, the vitamins and minerals uh, from the plants are water soluble. So I do like to drink them in a tea. Vitamins A, B, C, and E. There's le lots of minerals like calcium and iron, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium. Well, you can read all of this. It's really good for the skeletal system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, and it's also great for anybody who has a uterus. Um, whether you're just starting your menstrual cycle or you're pregnant, getting ready to give birth, or towards the um, getting towards your change of time into menopause, like it'll it'll really help balance everything in your system. And it's not just for women either, like every human needs good vitamins and minerals in their system. So those are one of the things. And then the next one I want to talk about quickly is elderflower. I just love the elderberry, like the elder tree. It's so beautiful in the summertime. 
the it flowers uh, end of June, beginning of July, right around then, depending on the type of weather we've been getting. Um, great for the pollinators. It's got tons of pollen. When I go to clip the branches and I clip it and then I let it go, it just goes with all the pollen and I come out of there just covered, like just in yellow dust. Um, it does make me sneezy. However, when I when you drink it and it's tea form, it's specifically for seasonal allergies and this inflammation right here. If you have uh, like sinitis or anything like that, it really helps open you back up. It's good for the respiratory system, fevers, cold flus. Um, it's a relaxing nerving. And even when you look at the plant after all of the flowers or all of the berries are shaken off, it almost looks like the synapsis of the brain, um, which is Sometimes plants tell us what they're good for. So I feel like that's how it's trying to communicate like, hey, I'm also really good for the nervous system. Um, however, it does also look like the alveoli of the lungs too. So I always thought that was really interesting how plants try to talk to us. <clears throat> so I want to leave time for our other great uh, presenters today. Um, thank you very much if anybody needs to contact me. Here's my contact information. You can also visit my uh, my website if you have any questions or want to check things out. You can find me through there as well. And thank you very much. Is I okay? Hey. On time? <laughs> thank, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. That was fantastic. And next up, we have um, Martha Vandiver with the Paul Smith's College Vic. We can see it, Martha, <laughs> and you're you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so nice to be here, Sean. Thanks so much for pulling this together. APIP, thank you. And uh, Shadeya Kwa, this uh, the presentation is fascinating. Um, I hope our paths cross in person at some point in the future. Um, I'd love to learn learn more about about what you're doing. Um, I have stolen from E.O. Wilson, who's a very famous biologist, um, the title for my talk, "The Little Things That Run the World," um, adding that they really are critical. And I'm referring to insects, to invertebrates. Um, E.O. Wilson died sadly a little over a year ago, but um, suffered a fishing hook accident when he was quite young and blinded himself in his right eye. And what happened was that he ended up with a left eye that had really exquisite um, 2010 vision. And he was able to see small things very, very carefully, very clearly, and um, devoted much of his life to the study of of ants, um, but and also in his career um, was deeply committed to conservation and, and biodiversity and uh, really helped illuminate just how critically important um, insects, insects are. Okay, I need to move forward. Sean. Try, try clicking on your screen doing that. <laughs> Maybe the arrow key. I know I saw Shateo Claw's arrow key, but I'm not seeing it. There we go. There you go. Okay. I hope I hope I don't run through all of these. Okay, what are we going to talk to about today? We're going to talk about your own backyard, what you can do in your own backyard, irrespective of what it looks like, whether it's um, a balcony on, or a porch or, or a big meadow. And we're going to talk about the impact of invaders or invasive species. We're going to talk about diversity too. And is that the most important thing that we need to be thinking about? I think we're all steeped in the critical importance of diversity of all kinds, biodiversity as well as, as human diversity. Um, when we're talking about native plants and native pollinators, we need there's it's kind of nuanced, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about nature's hot dog, and then I'll just do a quick summary. Um, and give Lisa some time to 
to present her talk. So I have relied um, for much of the, just preparing this on Doug Talmy's work. I don't know if everyone's familiar with Doug Talmy. He's at the University of Delaware, another superb scientist. His recent book, Nature's Best Hope, um, presents a, a, an idea that um, there, we can all have a homegrown national park. Um, he addresses the loss of habitat and the impacts that that's had and, and really um, provides a 101 on what we can all do to improve habitat and again, in our own backyards, what, irrespective of what those, those backyards look like. Um, also, I've highlighted this um, Caterpillar of Eastern North America guide by David Wagner. Um, hopefully, everyone's going to be slightly more interested in caterpillars at the end of this. Um, they um, kind of anchor the food, the food web for, for a lot of our terrestrial birds as well as, as many other um, critters. Mm -hmm. And um, if you catch the caterpillar, caterpillar bug, so to speak, um, there are thousands of them and you're going to want a little help trying to figure out um, what, what species they are. So I'm going to dive right into um, invasives before moving forward. Um, and, you know, I've put up this quote, nothing beats that red flame bush color that we see every fall. Flame bush has been planted everywhere. It's used by homeowners. It's used by landscaping companies. And just anecdotally, when I moved into the house I live in, which is just around the corner from the Vic, um, the woman who built my house lives next door to me, my elder. And she um, built a log cabin. It's beautiful. I am lucky to live here. And she planted flame bush here. And out of respect for her, year after year, I left the flame bush in the yard and I kept dumping all my wood ash on it, hoping I would kill it off. And I managed to kill one of them, but there were still some out there. And a couple of years ago, I was wandering around the yard and finding flame bush seedlings. You want them a swing, you want them a seedlings all over the place. And I said, this is enough. I went and got my saw and I cut the whole thing down. And I thought, Martha, this is an education moment. You need to talk to Nora. You need to explain to her, you know, why this is not a good thing. So Anyway, just a quick note too, um, Sean, thank you for the Euonymus in green leaf. And then there's that other one that shows that red flame color. It is super easy to identify. It has that winged um, look on the stem, that, that uh, structure there, um, super easy to identify. And when it's young, it's really easy to pull up. So if you see this, please do all of us a favor. It's dispersed by birds it gets scattered throughout woods very quickly. So it is something we really need to get rid of. So I wanna talk about ecosystem function um, and just in a tiny little nutshell. nutshell um, ecosystems run much more smoothly, they run longer and they run more productively when they have all of their parts. Um, if we uh, remove species, um, we're going to diminish that ecosystem. It becomes less stable and less productive. And when we replace native ecosystems with introduced and invasive plants, it really compromises how that ecosystem functions. So when non-natives uh, are planted, we're reducing the number of species and the species interactions that go on in, in those various ecosystems. So just to... Um, dive into this just a little bit more. Um, in that first column, when we're talking about time, um, our native plants have had millions of years to evolve, co-evolve with one another. So they've been duking it out for millions of years. And, um, you know, like, hey, I've, I'm growing fast and tall. You just got to deal with shade. You've got to figure it out. You know, our ecosystems are complex and they're um, designed in a way Evolution is still occurring. It's not that they're static, but our native plants have had a lot of time to figure out how to interact with one another. I see invasives kind of as bullies. They can take over very quickly. Um, they come into a habitat that uh, may still have some spots open for it, and they will um, they will just take over willy nilly. And there aren't those evolutionary stops that the coevolution of species um, evolving together uh, provide. Um, and if we look at the quality um, of uh, our habitats, native 
plants are almost always better at filling ecological roles than introduced species are. Introduced species um, that provide uh, both in vegetation and their fruits, um, they're just not good at providing um, resources to our native animal life. And that includes insects and, and all, kinds of, all kinds of animals. Um, in general, um, our insect herbivores are really picky eaters. They are um, diet specialists. Over 90% of our insect herbivores, I'm talking about North America, are restricted to one or just a few host plants. So obviously what that means is if the host plant isn't there for them, the species can't go through its life cycle. So uh, invasives are not helping us out much. In terms of the services that are provided in these ecosystems, um, when we lose species, as I said earlier, we lose ecosystem functions. And so invasives are taking up space and not, not giving a lot in return. And one example here is Phragmites. Uh, so Tehaqua talked about this. Um, they have been present in North America for just about 500 years, and they are host to a total, whopping total of five um, insect herbivores. There may be more, but to date we know of five. In their native European environment, they're host over 170. So as we know, um, Phragmites is super invasive. It produces, it spreads clonally and produces this map that just wipes out other um, wetland species. And uh, it's, it's not doing a lot for us. And nutritionally, just on that same note, um, introduced species, cultivars um, tend to be, if they're producing fruits, they tend to be higher in sugar and lower in critical fats and proteins. So for example, um, if monarchs don't have goldenrod and wood asters, to nectar on in the fall, um, they're not going to get all those nice fats and proteins that they need that set them up to migrate um, that 2,000 miles to, to Mexico. So um, invasive species um, are really compromising um, our native species, species at a nutritional level, and that, that impacts individuals as well as populations. So meet the team. We're just gonna be talking about um, already, we're talking about native bees. We're talking about Lepidoptera. You probably all know our, that's the order of um, moths and butterflies. We're gonna be talking about them. Yes, we're gonna talk about birds. Uh, not only do I love birds, but um, as I said, this is heavy to caterpillars and um, a lot of our terrestrial bird species are, are dependent on, on caterpillars. And of course, um, Native plants are, are part of our part of our team here. So, um, what services are our insect pollinators providing? Well, ninety percent of our flowering plants need to be pollinated, and bees provide the vast majority of those pollination. Um, services. We have uh, about 4,000 native bee species in North America. And in New York, we have about 450 or so. Um, insects are the primary means of taking energy from the sun and turning it into food. Most vertebrates don't eat plants. Um, so we are dependent on um, our insects to convert the energy from, from sunlight um, and, and produce food. And we're all familiar with uh, food webs and food chains and so on. So we have our insects to thank for, for taking, taking the sunlight and, and turning it into food. Um, and our invertebrate populations have declined 45% in the last 40 years, something that um, we all need to be I think we all need to be concerned about. And those losses are largely due um, to losses in habitat and appropriate, appropriate plants. So just a little more on pollination services. As I mentioned, bees are doing the vast majority of the pollinating for us. Honeybees were introduced in the early 1600s. I think it was about 1620 or so. Prior to that time, all of our pollination services in, in North America were being taken um, 
care of by by native plant native bees. In other words, we we have what we need um, to to provide pollination services here in our temperate our temperate environment. Um, and just a PS, honeybees are the ones that sting. Our, of our 4,000 species of native bees, they don't sting. Yes, wasps and yellow jackets do sting, but they aren't bees. Um, so butterflies and moths, particularly in the temperate zone, are not very good at pollinating. However, they are really fabulous at producing caterpillars. Um, which are, are consumed by predators. And, and that's all part of that, um, taking sunlight and converting it into energy and producing these um, insects that other, other birds and other animals can eat. But our butterflies can only do this um, bang up job of producing caterpillars if they have the proper host plants um, to uh, nectar on and to, to lay their eggs on and rear, their, rear the young. So what do insects need? They need adequate food and they need adequate habitat. So what's the fuss about native plants? So Doug Talmy talks a lot about this in his Bringing Nature Home book. And that first photo of, um, of lawn, of the suburban home with a lot of lawn, it is the least productive of all of our plantings. And um, I know lots of people who love to mow lawn, there's a you know, certain comfort in being able to play on the lawn and that kind of thing, but we don't all need vast, vast um, area, acreage of, or hectareage of, of lawns. We just, I feel that we've just got a little bit too much of it. That second shot shows a more urban area that looks quite tidy, but um, there's really not much to eat in there. There's not much available for our native um, insectivore populations. There are a lot of introduced species there. Tommy talks a lot about how it doesn't take much. Each of us can contribute to pre um, preparing and providing habitat. You know, and here's somebody who's, um, tending just a little patch of, of milkweed outside their home. And again, um, you don't need you know, 50 acres of meadow, but maybe you live in an apartment and you've got a balcony and maybe you can just pop a butterfly weed into a, into a pot and put that on, on your balcony. Pollinators will find these and they find them remarkably quickly. So how functional are these ecosystems? You know, we talked about what ecosystems are doing for our herbivores. Again, there's that lawn on the left. Um, I would wager that's probably some introduced pear tree that people are hoping will eventually produce shade. But there's there's just not there's not a lot of diversity in um, in that that scene, which is so prevalent in in our uh, suburban areas. Phragmites in the center again. It, it's not providing many services to many native species at all. And then an urban environment that um, looks pretty sad without, without any, any green. And then whoop, if we take a look at um, these other photos, you know, that the folks on the left-hand side have decided uh, not to mow their lawn and, um, just to, to, I'm sure they've planted some of that, but maybe maybe some of that has come up naturally too. The photo in the middle, um, these people have at least seven different plants um, labeled there in their picture that they're they're providing. Maybe they're herbs, maybe they're vegetables in there, but um, it is some nice diversity there to um, offer to to passing pollinators. And then a community garden in in an urban environment. Um, there are plenty of Lepidoptera, plenty of moss and butterflies that that um, host on vegetables. We can see sunflowers in that picture too. There's a lot of um, vertical diversity, which always increases biological diversity. Um, and I have found in my own garden that if I am patient and depending on what part of the season the eggs are laid on my plants, if I'm just patient and let those caterpillars quickly go through their life cycle and grow up, there is almost always, if not always, enough vegetation left, enough photosynthetic material um, that they can put out new leaves and actually produce some, some vegetables in the course of the season, even in the Adirondacks. Um, so I was saying there's kind of this nuanced issue about diversity when we're, we're talking about native plants and native pollinators. Absolutely, yes, let's, to the extent that we can, um, plant and caretake our native plants. 
but I'm just asking this question or tell me ask, asks this question about is higher diversity always the best? Well, um, we've heard about keystone species and tell me talks about them vis-a-vis -vis insectivores. So um, specifically what's out there that's going to fuel um, our Lepidopteran populations. And by far and away, oaks, oaks are the powerhouse of um, the keystone species for our um, insectivores. And if you live in, in the mid-Atlantic, and I think he's still counting here, but he's um, identified over 557 different species of caterpillars that use oaks. So I don't know if everybody on the call is um, from the Adirondacks. We have some red oak here. We're probably gonna have more as the climate warms. Um, but if you are in a position where um, oaks are native, by all means, um, make the investment and plant one tomorrow um, because they really make a big difference. Here in the Adirondacks, Prunus is our star performer, the cherry. And that's no slouch with 455 species of caterpillars that it supports. Willow and birch are right behind with over 400 species each. And then tell me did this really interesting research with his grad students. They compared habitats that were composed of native species and then habitats that had um, a pretty big complement of invasive species in them as well. And what they found was that even in the native habitats, 5% of the local plant genera hosted 70 to 75% of the Lepidopteran. So in other words, even in a fully native um, habitat, only 5% of those uh, genera in the habitat were supporting the vast majority of um, host sites for moths and butterflies. So this is what we mean about keystone species. Yes, let's let's present as much of a native smorgasbord as we can, but um, it really does make a difference to pay attention to which these keystone species are and where we can make sure that we're we're planting those. So when you get all this right, um, what do you have? You've got host plants, and this um, ability to produce lots of caterpillars that in this case, we're, again, we're just looking at birds that really can fuel um, uh, the, the breeding of, of birds. And, and Taomi refers to them as little sausages. You know, they're these thin wrappers filled with protein and fat. And when you think about um, feeding, feeding young, um, you're not gonna want some super bristly caterpillar or beetle that has those hard chitinous um, wings on it. You know, you want something, a little pillow, just of fat and protein. And birds are trying to fledge their young as quickly as they can, right? The longer they stay in the nest, the more susceptible they are to pre uh, predation. So they need lots of fat and protein, grow up those birds, get them out of the nest and, and send them on their way. 96% percent of our terrestrial birds in North America choose to feed their young caterpillars. So even if uh, normally they eat fruit or let's even take a robin, they switch during the breeding season, they switch their food source for their young and, and hunt caterpillars. They're making about 150 trips a day to feed their, to feed their young. And you've probably seen this figure, it takes about 9,000 caterpillars to fledge a clutch of chickadees, just start thinking about that. I mean, the biomass of the caterpillars out there is huge and we need to make sure we've got host plants for them so that so that they can go through the life cycle. And then just, you know, are you gonna, it takes about 200 aphids to produce the same biomass of one nice juicy caterpillar, you know, and to get those same fats and proteins. So if you're a bird, you're gonna, if you're making 150 trips a day, you're gonna look for that juicy, juicy fat caterpillar. So in summary, um, native plants support significantly higher numbers of insect species than introduced and invasive plants. Um, and I'm sure Lisa's gonna talk about this too with cultivars. I mean, there are difference with cultivars. You know, the cultivars aren't as nutritionally um, rich as our, our native species. Um, insects rule the world. 
um, without them, we really would have devastating consequences. When you start thinking about all that they're doing for us in terms of recycling decayed litter and, and taking that um, energy from the sun and turning it into food. And then we need to, to the extent that we can, we just need to be vigilant about including these keystone species um, in, in our yards or, or on our, our balconies. And then just lastly, and I'll be quick about this, I just wanna talk about the thrill of the process of this. I am by no means an expert in any of this with native plants and native pollinators. I am having so much fun um, learning about this. And I'm in year six of not mowing my lawn. And, you know, honestly, the first two years were really, really hard. I could not look at my yard and relax. Visually, it was so unpleasant looking to me and unkempt and I knew it was driving my lovely elder neighbor crazy because it no longer looked like a golf course and it just now every year I'm finding new stuff in my meadow I mean I, I haven't planted it it's in a in a seed bank that that um is is actually now germinating and it's just been really really fun and and to know to know more, to learn more every year about, okay, it'd be kind of cool to have that caterpillar. You know, what host plant does it need? And, and can I start planting that and tending that? So for me, it's just this opportunity for, for lifelong learning and, and I'm having a really great time. So, whoops, thanks everybody. Um, please come to the Vic if you haven't been there, we'd love to welcome you in the Butterfly House or anywhere on our trails. And um, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, Martha. That was fantastic. And last but not least, we have Lisa. Whenever you're ready, Lisa. Okay. Okay, can everybody see everything? We're good. So um, I'm going oh, to- we, we can't Go see ahead. your screen, Lisa. You can't? Okay. No, make sure you hit the blue share button there. I did, so let me just go through. That's usually the trick where it gets hung up. <laughs> yeah, I just went through the blue button, but let me go back to it, hang on. Sorry about that. Those of us that do this once or twice a year. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, a share screen button that's green. Is it different from yours? Maybe, yeah, you, you need, th there's two things to do. You select the screen you want to share, and then there mm -hmm. should be a button that says share. Once you've selected what you want to share, you hit the share button. Okay. So mine says share screen. It's a little different than what we practiced this morning. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. There's always a little learning curve with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Share screen. So it's still blocking me here. Okay, is that better? There it is, yes, <laughs> thank you, yes. Okay, well, let me get into, and are you Phew. seeing the entire view or are you so seeing the other view. We're, we're not seeing the full screen view yet. Okay, I'll do that too. If you click um, under where it says file in the top left from beginning, that should... Mm -hmm. That should do it. There it was. It was hidden by all your pretty faces. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Are we go good to go now? Do all set. Well? Yes. Okay. Okay. First, I'm going to start with a commercial. Um, I volunteer for a group called Adirondack Action. For those of you who live in the Adirondacks, I highly recommend that you look up this group, get involved. Um, when I first moved here 12 years ago. Um, to a very small town called Minerva. Um, I tried to get involved, but there were only so many bake sales you could do. And I wanted to do something that aligned with my passion of photography, bugs, and flowers. 
So Adirondack Actions gave me that, um, that opportunity. We also have other projects we work on, um, road salt reduction, food security. So there's a whole host of things, composting. So I, I encourage all of you to go to Adirondack Action and uh, see our, our, process, our uh, projects. Okay. The Adirondack Pollinator Project is one of our largest projects. Um, it started in 2016 as an outgrowth from a monarch and milkweed project. Um, it's, we have some great partners in this project, including the Wild Center and the Paul Smith Vic. Um, we're around to promote awareness of the Adirondack pollinators and the habitats they need. Um, so far, we've installed 20, excuse me, 40 pollinator gardens throughout the Adirondacks. We do native seed distribution. In fact, if you want seeds, you can go onto our website and request free native seeds. Um, we host a native plant sale every year. This year, it'll be June 3rd, but you can pre-order the plants now online. Um, this year, we also came up with a library um, program. So we have pollinator resources going out to 20 different um, libraries throughout the Adirondacks. Um, we have great resources online. So look at, you know, there are all sorts of plant lists and planning ideas. We're doing a pollinator happy hour um, the end of the month. We have a pollinator trailer that you might have seen traveling around the Adirondacks with large pictures of pollinators on it. We use it when we do our projects. And every year we host a pollinator intern that um, from Colgate University that does all sorts of cool projects for us. This year, we're looking at doing um, some more roadside pollinator and probably landfill, capped landfill work with that, with that intern. Okay, um, I'm not a trained lepidopterist. I have no background. My training is in investor relations for large publicly, training com um, publicly traded companies. Um, but I have a passion for wild, you know, for wildlife, small wildlife photography. And this is a picture of my house in Minerva. Um, you can see my unkept gardens. Um, my husband's whining there on the porch about not having a lawn. Um, <laughs> we do not have a lawn. We just have pods of flowers all around the property. Well, I don't have a very big property. So in my backyard at any given time, um, you know, I'll just walk around and all these, all these flowers have come from our previous plant sales at Adirondack Action and they're natives. Um, and this is what I do. I love iPhone photography. So this is me walking around the yard. This is 10 feet from my door and cool caterpillar on some stinging nettle. Three different pollinators sharing the same bloom. So a lot of you have, uh, and Martha talked about Dalatome, but um, there's been a lot in the press recently about, you know, a new garden ethic. I'm changing. Who are you gardening for? Are you gardening for yourself? Uh, are you gardening for Martha Stewart? Because she says you need to have these certain flowers. Um, and um, we had Benjamin Vogt, we had him at our first pollinator um, symposium in North Creek five years ago. And I think he sums it up pretty well. He said, our landscapes push aside wildlife and in turn diminish our genetically programmed love for the wilderness. How can we get ourselves back into balance through the gardens to speak life's language and learn from other species? This is Benjamin sitting in his backyard and he lives in a very um, controlled suburban environment. So I'm sure his, his um, neighbors hate him. Doug, as we talked about bringing nature home, um, you know, he encourages everyone with an access to a patch of earth can make a significant contribution. Um, and he has a kid's book coming out on bringing nature home. It'll be out on April 4th. Okay, I got involved. I used to be one of those gardeners who used to have, have to have the latest plant. So proven winners would come out and say, oh, look at this variegated, wonderful plant you have to have it in your garden. So I would go you know, to our garden center and buy it and that sort of stuff. I had a beautiful herb garden in my front yard and 
I got into pollinators because every year I had caterpillars attacking my plants. So I drove down to Agway. I look up in the ortho Bible. Ortho is a killing Bible, by the way. Uh, and it tells me how to kill, you know, whatever's on my plants. So I, before I actually learned what I was killing, I probably killed 250 black swallowtail caterpillars. And that's this butterfly. So that's, this is my, my interest in bugs after I found out that I was killing butterfly, you know, butterfly caterpillars was just, just took off and the learning curve is, I'm still learning. Um, the 2000, I looked for surveys that showed how much of the fauna we have here in the United States, especially in, you know, in terms of all the development we have is native versus non-native. And I'll get that into that in a minute, but I found a 2017 survey of US plants and the taxonomists that did the survey found that 51% of plants that they ID'd were non-native. And I, it's even probably higher now. I worked as, um, as a census supervisor and got to travel all around the Adirondacks seeing different houses and developments and things. And I just was shocked at what I saw in terms of, you know, 500 burning bushes lining up a driveway or, you know, um, barberry still being used, that sort of thing. So let's talk a little bit about native versus non-native versus invasive. This is a funny screenshot of my, down at my father's house on, on the Chesapeake. He has um, monarchs coming through there, just like, um, and they roost every night in the trees, but they're roosting, um, a lot of them are roosting in English, invasive English ivy. So we'll talk about some of the interactions. Um, to really understand what you're doing in New York, you just need to have a couple concepts. So native, native plants were here and they've existed historically in the Adirondacks prior to colonization. So prior to all those lady, little ladies coming with seed pockets full of seeds of all their favorite European plants. Non-native or alien plants, um, they, they didn't exist here, but they've been introduced due to human activities. So non-native plants don't always pose a threat to native plants, but yeah, they typically don't support the ecosystem. So the picture here is actually two non-natives. It's a Brazilian verbena, and this butterfly was actually starting to become, a, it's a migrant to the Adirondacks thanks to climate change, but it's the largest butterfly in, in uh, North America, the giant swallowtail. And so both of those I found in my garden. And invasive plants. Um, this is a, invasive plants are non-native and their introduction to the Adirondacks and other areas is likely to cause economic or environmental harm. In this case, the picture of this, this picture is um, a swallowtail butterfly and everybody looks at it and says, oh, that's phlox. Well, that's not really phlox. It's, excuse me, let me go back there. It's a, oops, shoot, I'm sorry. Let me go back here. I'm, How can I get back my slide back, guys? There are oh. arrows sort of in the lower left. Yeah, I'm not seeing them here, so. They're, they're kind of translucent right there. Yep. OK, sorry. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> hit the wrong thing. I have all you guys, all your pictures blocking that kind of stuff. So anyway, invasive species, this um, plant is called Dame's Rocket. It looks, it's a spring blooming plant. It's gorgeous. It, there's a lot of it in the Adirondacks. It was introduced here. And well, before I knew it, um, as, a, as an invasive species, it looks like it's harmless. There's butterflies all over it. There are bees all over it. But actually, um, it's aliopathic, which means its roots poison other plants. So it really takes over and takes out all your native plants. So just because things have pollinators on them don't mean they're actually a good plant to have in your yard. And I've learned that. Okay. So it's one of my favorite plants in the Adirondacks, flea blame. You probably all have it in your yard. And a little tiny fly enjoying it. Okay, so we're going to go. Okay. So 
if you're out there and you want to buy, verify plants as natives, um, there's a couple resources you can check. Um, my favorite is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So go to their site. You can search by common name. You can look at maps. They even have pollinator value listed on their plants. Um, the USDA, their plant database, um, usda.gov. You can search by common name also. So say you show up to a nursery and you're looking for something and you're not quite sure. And the, you know, the person there who's not very well trained said, oh yeah, that's native. You can check it. So I would recommend going to both these sites and checking. Another site that's not as well organized and it's having, I think a little technical difficulties that hasn't been updated in a bit, uh, BONAP, uh, the Biota of North America. So for instance, this was a chart that I pulled out, a map that I pulled out. I searched for swamp milkweed, which is native to, actually you can see the little group the, right here, the green county, it's Essex County. Um, and that's what I was looking for, but it's a, it'll give you a map of every plant, where it's native, where it's not native, where it's introduced, that sort of thing. Um, I think it, it's, it needs to be updated. Um, their site isn't secure. You'll get all sorts of remote messages for it now. So I would go with the other two first. And if you can't find it, then go to this third. So Martha touched on cultivars and nativars. So when you look at plants and you'll see a name, say um, purple coneflower, echinacea, and then afterward it has in parentheses like, um, you know, Cheyenne Sunrise or something like that. Um, that's a cultivar. Nativars are actually native plants that have some other things bred into them. So what about them? They're mostly, I would avoid them, but there are some that are okay and that are outperforming some of our natives. Um, there's a, excuse me, I'm blocking out of again. Um, Mount Cuba Center. In Delaware, Mount Cuba is a de former DuPont estate. Um, the woman who, Mrs. DuPont, actually traveled throughout the Adirondacks and throughout the Northeast, um, relocating plants from there to her garden. And now since she's, um, she's gone, it's a public garden and they do a lot of research. Um, so go to their site, look at their research, but they're Per, like for instance, they did a purple coneflower um, research a few years ago, and they found actually for, actually for pollinators, many of the cultivars outperformed the straight species in terms of attractiveness as a nectar source. Um, in nativar, they did nativar studies too, and found that plants, um, insects avoided plants that were bred to have red leaves versus the native one that would have green leaves. Um, so, but they have some interesting research there if you want to want to check it out, if you ever have a chance to, you know, look at cultivars. If you're looking to plant a garden and um, wanted some ideas for planting resources, um, pollinator.org has a great Adirondack regional guide. Um, the Xerces Society have re has regional planting guides for this area. We have all the links on the Adirondack Action Pollinator um, website. The Butterfly House at Paul Smith's full of all sorts of great um, butterfly plants and ideas. And so does the Wild Center's Pollinator Garden. This is, there are very few books about wildflowers of the Adirondacks, but this is one I found a couple years ago. Um, so you're, you're, you know, you're pretty much better off on a lot of the online sites looking for pollinator resources. So if you're at, a, say you're at the nursery and you, you want to buy some natives and you find some natives and you say, wow, this is great. Well, first check that there's, you know, check the plants like I showed you, go to Lady Bar Johnson or whatever, or if you trust the tags um, and the, the people that are working there. Ask them where the plants were raised. A lot of the plants that the nurseries get in here are from Connecticut or Maryland or whatever. You wanna, you, you wanna see what their parentage is. And I, I 
I tend to like the plants that are grown in the Northeast. They're a little bit, um, you know, they've been raised in, in greenhouses, but they're also from cuttings or from plants that were up here. Um, I found some of the ones that even though they say they were good for this zone, weren't. Um, the big question is, were they raised without pesticides? You all know um, when it comes to pollinators, pesticides are just like the kiss of death. There used to be a class of um, pesticides that was used in mostly big box stores, but also some smaller nurseries called neonics that actually poisoned the whole stem so it couldn't be eaten. It actually went into the pollen, into the pollen and into the nectar so that any bug that ate the, you know, that came through and nectared on them, you know, basically died. Um, other things you want to check when you're looking at plants, check out the bloom times. If you're going to have a garden, make sure you have something available from spring through frost. And aim for a variety of blossoms. Um, you don't want all things that look like purple cone flowers and daisies. So one of the key sources, here I'm doing it again, here one of the key sources of um, plants, we do a plant sale for Adirondack Action. And that's how we generate our funds to keep the pollinator project alive. Um, these are the transplants that we get. We get from a, a nursery that grows transplants and then we, trans, um, we plant them into gallon pots and grow them out. So by the time we sell them, they're, most are blooming or you know, have quadrupled in size. So this is the, the transplants when we first put them in the, um, in the pots last year. But we will have the plant sale this year, um, June 3rd at Heaven Hill Farm, which is um, off of the military highway. And so it's a greenhouse in Lake Placid. And we will be starting to plant those in mid-April. If anyone likes, would like to volunteer, just contact us and we'll show you how to plant them. And one of the, if you're looking at um, another resource for your garden, this is my Bible. Um, Heather Holm is a Midwesterner, but she actually took um, and put together a resource called Pollinators of Native Plants. And I've never seen this done before where she goes and shows for each plant you're planting, Ooh. Okay, let's go back here. Each plant you're planting, she'll go and um, tell you what, what type of insects will visit, what type of insects will eat it. Um, it. It's just amazing. Usually you have three or four books, you know, a book on caterpillars that'll tell you what to plant for caterpillars, a book on flowers that'll tell you what bee, you know, what bees or butterflies come to it. But this book actually ties it all together. So I would recommend anybody looking um, for a good resource to, to get this. And for those of you who are, um, you know, say you get to the point where you're just so frustrated with your gardening and things, um, and I can't do this, it's too much work, you know, um, I'll, I'll show you a couple funnies. So pollinators also like things like dog poop. <laughs> So if you have some of that around your garden, it happens. Um, so pollinators will come to that for minerals and some, some nutrition. Uh, pollinators are all, you can also put watermelon out and attract pollinators. But uh, there's all sorts of ways to get pollinators into your, into your life. We hope you're going to plant as many native plants as possible and have monarchs, which are not the greatest pollinators. But um, other pollinators come and visit. Anytime I go out in my garden in the summertime, I'll have at least a few hundred pollinators. And they can be from the size of, you know, barely visible, the size of a grain of rice to, you know, the majestic monarch. So I encourage all of you to go out there to um, take a look, see what you have, and you, you just get excited. I mean, you get excited about oh, something's chewing more leaves. You know, something's flying around, that sort of thing. And then it's it's really it's really catching because your neighbors will be coming in too and seeing what they can see in your gardens. And then they'll it'll spread to their gardens and 
eventually you'll get your whole neighborhood involved. So I encourage all of you to plant native plants. Um, reach out to us at Adirondack Action if you need help. And uh, we'll see you at our plant sale. Good. Hey, thanks a lot, Lisa. Sure. And I just have a couple quick things here before we do a Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, start typing them in the chat. Um, I, I usually encourage people to do that instead of having everyone try to speak um, out loud, uh, just because it can kind of become chaotic with 60 people. <laughs> so um, if you do have some questions, please start putting them in the chat. And what I, I will do is I'll kind of go through and, and read them to the presenters. Uh, and, you know, at the end, if your question somehow got missed, you can you could uh, speak up and let us know. So I'm just going to share my screen one more time here. All right, everybody see that? All right, APIP has a couple upcoming events that I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about. Uh, we have our Backyard Invasives webinar. We do that every year. We focus on a handful of terrestrial invasive species that you can look for in your backyards and, and talk about some identification and management tips, things like that. That'll be Wednesday, May 24th. Um, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. We do not have the Zoom link set up for that. We're uh, waiting on a couple things, but it should be up soon, probably within the next couple of weeks. And then I'm really excited about this one. Um, early June is New York State Invasive Species Awareness Week. And for that week, we're gonna be doing a photography for IMAP invasives. IMAP invasives is New York State's invasive species uh, database. and. Uh, anyone can go and report invasive species that they find, you know, as they're as they're hiking or, you know, uh, out, out in a park somewhere or, or wherever they may be. And I, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's uh, IMAP Invasives. Um, and we're going to have a photography workshop that's going to focus on some basic photography tips. If you're just looking to be like an amateur photographer and want to pick up some tips, it, it'll be a great one. Uh, but then it's going to dive into particularly how to photograph species so that they can more easily be identified. And then that's the whole thing with a map uh, you know people submit photos and then um, at, the, at the other end you know people will will look at these photos and and try to confirm whether or not it is in fact an invasive species so having you know good clear photos is really important so that's going to be happening in early june and that the date and time are to be determined uh, keep an eye on either our facebook page our instagram we'll be announcing it there and then you can also check out our website adkinvasives.com um, if you want to learn more about that and we, we do have an events page there and then last but not least, I want to uh, give you guys a couple examples of ways you can get involved with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Uh, we have our, and these, these are both volunteer programs, we have our forest pest hunters uh, that focuses on terrestrial or land-based invasive species. Uh, forest pest hunter volunteers are basically trained community scientists, and they adopt a trail or forest stand, which they then monitor for signs of priority forest pests and pathogens. We've really been focused on um, beech leaf disease and hemlock woolly adelgid lately. Um, since its inception in 2021, program's only a couple years old, uh, there have been more than uh, 30 forest pest hunters who have surveyed more than 100 trails in the Adirondacks. And that's resulted in more than 600 total observations of, of invasive species, which is fantastic. Uh, the data collected um, by these volunteers really helps APIP and its partners document the presence of terrestrial invasive species throughout our Adirondack region. And just so you all know, a science background is not required to be a forest pest hunter. Um, anyone can learn how to participate Participate, and we do workshops and we have uh, free trainings and webinars and things like that. And you can find some of those on our YouTube page um, as well. And then we also have our Lake Protector program. Uh, since 2002, uh, hundreds of volunteers Tier lake protectors have learned how, how to identify, survey, and record data about aquatic invasive plants and animals that are impacting Adirondack lakes. Um, this is a fun and easy way to protect Adirondack lakes. Every summer, APIP hosts a number of trainings and orientations, uh, both in person and online, to prepare folks for getting out on the water. And just a quick short synopsis of what lake protectors do. They attend a training to learn how to identify and report aquatic invasive species. Uh, they sign up online to monitor a lake. 
Uh, they then monitor the lake at least once between July and September. Most volunteers spend one to three hours monitoring. And then uh, they report their findings back to APIP via paper forms online or through an app. And so if you want to learn more about any of the above, feel free to reach out to me directly. I can put you in touch with some of the people who run these programs. Um, you can also look at our website, again, adkinvasives.com to learn more about this and other things that APIP does. And let's get into our discussion. And before we do that, I just want to thank all three of our presenters. Um, very informative, really cool. I definitely learned some things today, so thank you. And let's get into the questions. It looks like we do have a few here right now. Let me just find where they start. So we have a question from Steve. What is your geographic boundary for what you recommend as native for pollinator gardens? This one might be for Lisa. That's always tough because we have, we look into New York State pretty much. Um, we try to get something that's native to New York State. As you know, the Adirondack Park is a lot of forest. Um, at some point, probably in the my you know place to see an era, it was a lot more grasslands or other things. But right now, uh, we have a lot of forest. So, in terms of the fauna that's here, um, we try to for our plant sale get things that have been documented here in the Adirondack Park. That's not always available. So, a couple items that we offer are within New York State. Um, but I think as long as you stay within New York State, you're okay. Unfortunately, the first year we ordered um, from a wildflower um, packager in another state, we ordered their wildflower mix, and it was for the state of Vermont. So we said, how bad can it be? Well, they had California poppy in it. So you always have to be on your guard. You never know. Uh, when you're buying seeds and things, plants are a little easier. So as I said, I think New York State would be the, the, the go-to um, um, geography for you. Well, Lisa, I'm assuming that the um, ADK yeah. Action, the seed mixes that they have available have been vetted? They do now. <laughs> <laughs> After that first misstep, um, we actually use seeds from Ernst a Seed. Um, they're in Pennsylvania, but they have a New England wildflower mix that has all been documented pretty much in this area. So we use that now. So we're very, um, and for those of you who are looking to do large areas, Ernst has a lot of different mixes um, and you can buy straight species um, or you can buy, you know, a mix of wildflowers and that sort of stuff if you're doing a large area. All right, next question. Do hay fields support pollinators? <laughs> I can take that, yeah. They do, but um, pollinators that are going to the flowers, um, some pollinators such as skippers will lay on timothy and other grasses, but unfortunately hay fields are to be mowed. So at some point, um, you know, a typical pollinator um, stays two weeks as a caterpillar you know, four or five days as an egg, two weeks as a caterpillar, and then a chrysalis. Well, most hay fields are, move, are you know, um, mowed during that time. So the life cycle is cut short. So in a way they do support, but then they also take away. And Lisa, here's another one for you. Will the pollinator plant sale have any pickup sites besides Lake Placid? Call me, my Subaru Outback can hold 120 <laughs> gallon pots of pollinators <laughs> plants. So yeah, we, we do deliver um, and we will have some, you know, we can make arrangements to get things to other areas since many, many of our um, members and people will be coming to the sale from other areas too. So like a, a pollinator uh, as a door dash that people use to yeah, get things yeah, my, car was the door, my car was the door dash <laughs> last year. As I said, I could fit 120 in my car. <laughs> The next question we have, in moving areas to reduce poison parsnip, how to encourage native plants? So I guess, is there a way to include native plant growth after you remove an invasive species? Does Martha or Lisa wanna? Martha, I'll defer to you. I've never dealt with uh, the wild parsnip craziness. I've seen it. 
Um, All I have, love it. Yeah, I haven't either. Um, I'm wondering if there's anybody um, on the webinar that can actually chime in on that one. Yeah, I'd be interested to know their tactics because it's really bad around here and just try to cut it, but it, the flower heads just grow back so quickly. It's hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. And if no one knows, I can uh, ask our terrestrial um, invasive species coordinator if she knows, and, and I will be sending a follow-up email in the next day or so, and I, I could include the answer in that. And I, th I think part of it has to do with how you control it, too. Are you going in and, you know, like, spraying it? I mean, just cutting it back is not going to, you know, it makes it stronger. But spraying it and really wiping it out um, or solarizing it with large sheets of, you know, like large tarps and things like that may work. Um, I know it doesn't work for Japanese knotweed, but it, for um, a perennial, like, um, for the parsnip, it may. I can speak a little bit about parsnips because I pull out a lot of it and I can just say that the leaf and the flower don't really give you a rash. It's the goo in this inside. If you cut it, then you're releasing that goo. And then if you touch that, that's the part that will be a problem. It has a straight root. And most of the time after good rain, you can pull it right out. Mm -hmm. And you try to get it before it goes to seed. It's biennial, meaning that'll come like whatever you pull out one year, um, whatever was there the year before will come out the next year. But uh, you can control it that way. Um, that's just what I've been doing. So, yeah, I've had the same tactic. It, it pulls out of the ground pretty easy. Like you said, it's a straight root. So when it's the ground's nice and soft, I just go in and try to pull out as many as I, I can physically do. <laughs> hey, where can someone find sweet grass to plant in their garden? <laughs> uh, honestly, I've only ever been given sweet grass from the pots just la last year from the the nursery program here in Akwazasne and that was pretty recent. I don't remember where they said they they got their their sweet grass from. Um, I know you can collect the seeds um, but it's not as easy to start from seed. It's like a small percentage that is actually viable within the seeds. Um, it is easy to transplant though, and it grows um, along roadsides and ditches and um, along rivers. It likes it where it's a little moist and on a nice sunny day, if you're out for a drive and you see a grass that is just like shiny and twinkling, um, chances are that's, that's the sweet grass. It has a really nice shine to it. And so the best day to identify it is when it's a nice sunny day because it literally will call you to it. Uh, Lisa, we have a request for your your um, email address, if you don't mind sharing that in the chat. Okay. And everyone, just so everyone knows, there are some great links um, popping up in the chat here. Um, Brian, thank you. He he put a link to a DEC webpage that has some information about um, Parsnip. And then we have Earned Seed uh, website URL in there and uh, some info on ADK Actions Volunteer Planning Day. And then we have all oh, the New York Flora atlas just popped up in there as well so i encourage everyone to check that out and and i uh, I, I can include lisa's if lisa's okay with it in the follow-up email um her her email as well i could include that in that follow-up email that'll have some links and um some some resources and things like that but right, that's all the questions in the chat um did, did i miss any if if not you could just uh, if i missed a question please just go off mute and shout it out and does anyone else have any other questions or anything to add to the discussion? Uh, and there's Lisa's email in the chat. <laughs> I I have a quick question regarding starting uh, milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, I live near, I'm from Akwazasne and I live on claims land and I've planted it um, two years ago and three years ago, I say plant. Um, basically just roughed up the soil and scattered it. Um, but I have not seen any activity with um, any of that coming up. So I wonder if you have any advice on that. 
I'm, I'm not sure if an invasive is overtaking that area and it's not getting sun or what it is. Well, milkweed is usually, especially you're talking about native milkweed with the large leaves. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it, you left it outside all winter. Did you yeah, plant it's, it in the it's, fall? it's been planted. Um, the seeds have been out there, you know, in the ground for over two years now. Okay. We've had really good success um, growing milkweed two ways. One, if somebody is going to go into an area and clean up like a ditch or something that has a lot of milkweed, it has rhizomes. So about six to eight inches down has these creepy long rhizomes. So you can actually dig them up and and replant those. If you want to do it by seed, we found out actually the best way, um, they need constant moisture and things over the winter. So take a milk jug, fill it with potting mix, uh, put a bunch of little seeds in there, tape it all back together so animals can't get, and then put it in a safe place outside so it can freeze all winter. And we found that, and, and in the spring, we find that naturally um, provides a, a microclimate that, uh, that helps more seeds generate. Um, you know, it's um, obviously it grows by itself out in the wild, but I think a lot of it, um, a lot of the seeds are eaten, a lot of the seeds distribute and do not grow. So they're they're tough to tough to um, to pollen to um, propagate sometimes. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right, well, if you think of something, feel free to email me and um, I'll, I'll pass it along to the appropriate people. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Please be sure to uh, follow uh, APIP on Facebook. It's a great way to just stay in touch with what we're doing, upcoming webinars and some other information. So thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. And see you at the next webinar. Yeah, thank you.